In this video, you'll see how ideas of electron configuration are applied to transition metals and their ions. So, these are the learning outcomes for this video. You'll first of all revise the idea of the way in which the periodic table is divided up into different blocks. You'll show how electrons are arranged in atomic orbitals by drawing diagrams, electrons in boxes. Uh, you'll be able to write out shorthand versions of the electron configuration for atoms and ions in the D block. And you'll look in particular at certain oxidation states of ions in the D block and explain why they are particularly stable. And finally, you'll also define transition metals in terms of their electron configurations. Okay, so here's the periodic table that we're familiar with, and you'll remember from AS that the periodic table is divided up into separate blocks. So we have the S block here on the left-hand side, the P block on the right-hand side, and the D block, which contains the transition elements which we're talking about particularly today. There's also the F block, which actually involves uh, atoms right down here at the bottom of the periodic table, and we're not going to be concerned with them today. Okay, so let's remind ourselves why it is that we can classify elements into S and P and D block. And the key thing is that you'll remember from AS this idea of energy levels. And the energy levels are divided into certain subshells. And if you look at the electron arrangement of electrons in a particular atom, you'll be able to find one energy level which contains the highest energy electrons. And depending on what type of subshell that is, determines where an element is in the periodic table. So D block elements will therefore contain electrons whose highest energy electron is in a D subshell. Now that's particularly interesting because we're aware, aren't we, that something odd happens around the boundary between the n equals 3 and n equals 4 shells. The lowest subshell of n equals 4, 4s, is actually lower in energy than the highest subshell of the n equals 3 energy level. And that is what gives transition elements their unusual electronic structure. OK, let's look at one particular skill that you need to have, which is the ability to be able to draw out the electron arrangement of transition elements, showing the electrons arranged in atomic orbitals. So let's see what this diagram shows. It shows that there are five orbitals which contain 3D electrons. Each orbital contain up to two electrons, so it means that there can be a total of up to 10 3D electrons. And there's also the need to consider the electrons in 4s orbitals. There's only one of those, so the 4s subshell can only contain two electrons. And transition elements, in the first row at any rate, contain electrons in both the 3d subshell and the 4s subshell. So let's have a look at some of the patterns that we see here. What we see is that all transition elements contain some 4s electrons. Most of them contain two 4s electrons. There are one or two exceptions, about two exceptions, and we'll spot that those are chromium and copper. Each of those only have one 4s electron. We'll see why that is in a minute. Second thing to notice is that the number of 3d electrons increases gradually as we increase the atomic number of the transition element, as we go across, in other words, the transition block. So scandium, the first element in the 3D, um, in the, the D block, has one electron in the 3D orbitals, titanium two, and so on. And now I think you can see why it is that chromium has only one electron in the 4S subshell. Basically, an electron has been taken from the 4S and added to the 3D. And the same thing happens here. Copper would normally be expected to have 9D electrons. Instead, it has 10 because one electron has been taken from the 4S subshell and put into the 3D. We may wonder why that is, but we can see if we look at the chromium and the copper arrangement that chromium has an exactly half filled D subshell. Copper has a complete D subshell. 
And so it turns out that those two elements have particularly stable configurations, and that is why energetically it's favourable to move an electron or promote an electron form from the 4S to the 3D subshell. So a couple of things to notice then. We've got the chromium and copper configurations, and the other thing to be aware of is that if you look at the way that electrons are arranged in the 3D subshells, they tend to occupy the orbitals singly until there are so many electrons in the 3D shell that there is no choice. So here we are, I am with six electrons in the 3D shell. Two of the electrons must be paired up in an orbital like that. You needn't worry too much about why the arrows are shown as pointing in opposite directions, but uh, by convention, that's what we do. OK, so you've seen the way in which we can draw out the electron arrangement. Now we're looking at the way in which that electron arrangement, electron configuration, can be deduced from looking at the periodic table. So we're going to take um, a transition element in that first row. We're going to look at the element vanadium. Here it is. Now, key thing to remember from AS is that vanadium contains several inner shells of electrons. And in fact, the inner electron shells have an identical arrangement to an argon atom. That means we needn't worry too much about the arrangement of electrons up to the first 18. But beyond argon, what happens? Well, the next electrons have to go into an S subshell. It's an S subshell in the fourth period of the periodic table, and therefore these are four S electrons. But you'll remember that above the four S subshell, there's a 3D subshell with a higher energy. So once the 4S subshell is full, the 3D subshell starts filling up. Now, vanadium is the third element in the that row of D elements, and so therefore it contains three D electrons. So perhaps you can just pause the video now and write down the electron arrangement of a vanadium atom. OK, so hopefully what you've written is this. Vanadium has a configuration of an argon core with two 4S electrons and three 3D electrons. Now that's the order of energies of the electrons, but it's usual to write the configuration keeping the 3D electrons before the 4S electrons. You may think that's slightly odd, but effectively it means that we're keeping all the n equals 3 subshells together. Within that argon core, there are also 3P electrons and 3S electrons. Usually examiners aren't too worried which way around you draw it, but in this video we will carry on using the second of those ways of writing the electron configuration with the 4S electrons uh, on the extreme right-hand side. OK, so let's look at some particular examples of atoms and also ions. So you can have a go at doing these. So it'll be useful if you have a copy of the periodic table handy. So you might like to pause the video while you look at that. And we're going to look, first of all, at an atom. We're going to look at a nickel atom. So perhaps you'd like to write down now what you think the configuration of a nickel atom will be. That's right, it'll have configuration argon core and then 3D8 for S2. Now we think about a nickel ion. So nickel tends to form an Ni2 plus ion by losing two electrons. The most important thing to know about transition metal ions is that when transition metal atoms lose electrons, they lose the 4S electrons first. Now that's rather odd because, of course, the 3D electrons have slightly higher energy. However, this is where it's helpful, I think, to have drawn out the electron configuration with those 4S electrons on the extreme right-hand edge. It makes it easier to remember that those are the ones lost first. So if you draw out the, write out the configuration of a nickel 2 plus ion, well, stop the video and do that now. Yes, of course, you'll find that it simply has configuration argon core 3D8. There's a very important principle to remember here, which is that the first row transition metal ions, the ones that you'll be considering, never contain any 4S electrons. Okay, They've all been lost, so any ion that you'll be dealing with will not contain any 4S electrons. If you write any, 
and in the exam answer, then you've made a mistake. Okay, we'll have a look at a slightly more difficult example now. So we're going to look at, again, an atom, and we're going to choose copper. Now, if you remember, copper was slightly harder. So just pause the video while you write down the configuration of copper. That's right. This is the unusual one where an electron is taken from a 4s subshell and put into a 3d subshell to give a 3d10 configuration. Okay, so what happens when we form ions? Well, uh, we know that 4s electrons are lost first. So what happens with a copper 2 plus ion? Write down the configuration of a copper 2 plus ion. So that's lost two electrons. It loses a 4s electron. And then the second electron to be lost comes from the 3D subshell, making it 3D9. Copper also forms a 1 plus ion. So you might like to write down or think about the configuration of a 1 plus ion. That's right. This time it's just the 4S electron that is lost. And we remind ourselves yet again the important principle that first row transition metal ions never contain any 4s electrons. That's certainly true for copper, isn't it? Now that helps us with defining the term transition elements. You may have thought that d block elements and transition elements meant the same thing, but in fact not. There is a strict definition of transition elements. They're elements that form at least one ion that's got a partially filled d subshell. In other words, contains between 1 and 9 electrons. OK, so we've seen that copper forms two ions, one of which is partially filled, the copper 2+, plus, and therefore it is a transition element. What about zinc? Well, zinc only forms a zinc 2 plus ion, and if you work out the configuration of that, it's 3d10, which is completely filled, and therefore zinc is not classified as a transition element. What about scandium? Well, scandium forms a scandium 3 plus ion. If you find scandium in the periodic table, you'll realize that that means that it will have lost all of its S electrons and D electrons, okay, and therefore is 3D0 and is not classified as a transition element. The final thing that the examiners are keen for you to know in terms of electron configuration is to explain the variable oxidation states of transition elements. You need to be aware that transition element elements form a range of oxidation states. Here are some of them. Absolutely no need to memorize this. You can see there's an interesting pattern there. The most important aspect in this context is to look at iron and manganese because some of the ions formed by iron and manganese will have a particularly stable electron configuration. They will have a configuration that contains a half-filled D subshell. And it turns out that's particularly stable. So you might like to pause the video now and think about which ions from manganese and iron will contain a half-filled D subshell. So pause the video and think about that. Yes, so what you should have come up with is the Fe3 plus ion, iron in the plus 3 oxidation state, which will have lost both the 4s electrons and one of the 3d electrons, giving it a configuration of 3d5. And the other one will be the manganese 2 plus. It's lost two 4s electrons, leaving the 3d5 electrons. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, it means that other oxidation states of iron or manganese will tend, everything else being equal, to eventually be converted into those particularly stable oxidation states. So, um, Fe2 plus, for example, is very easily oxidized to Fe3 plus, so iron rusts. And manganese 7 and manganese 4 compounds are easily reduced to manganese 2 plus. In fact, the both those processes occur when you use manganate 7 to oxidize Fe2 plus in a titration. That's the end of this video about electron configurations of transition elements.